Good morning. Welcome back to Venture Daily. On today's show, Palantir just locked in a $10 billion 10-year deal with the U.S. Army to streamline 75 contracts into one. It solidifies its role as the Pentagon's go-to software partner in the age of AI-driven warfare. I'm Josiah Simons. I'm Jackson Fordyce. It's Wednesday, August 6th. Let's get you smarter before your first meeting. Palantir has landed its largest ever contract, a 10-year, $10 billion deal with the U.S. Army to consolidate 75 separate contracts into one streamlined agreement. The move reflects Palantir's rising dominance in Washington, a shift towards software being seen as central to military readiness and a maturing partnership between Silicon Valley and the Pentagon. The Army says the deal will accelerate tech deployment and cut costs by eliminating middlemen. Is the latest in a series of wins for Palantir following contracts for battlefield intelligence systems, AI, R&D, and predictive logistics. Uh, and uh, that's Peter Thiel, uh, Alex Karp, and Joe Lonsda, which are the founders of Palantir. They founded it back yeah, in 2003. Yeah, the three-headed dragon. The three-headed dragon. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, CEO Alex Karp has made clear the company's ambitions to anchor Western military power through cutting-edge tech. And with this mega deal, Palantir cements its role as a cornerstone of modern U.S. defense strategy. Yes. Hand in hand. <laughs> father and son. That's right. Donaldo. The and prodigal Pe son hath returned. And Pedro Thiel. <laughs> All right. Well, for more on this story. Your numbers <laughs> exploding, right? Like, literally unbelievable. Hey, well, for more on this story. <laughs> oh my god. What gosh. are you doing? <laughs> I forgot. Well, for more on the story, I called an old friend of the show and an early investor in Palantir when it was just a startup, Ross Fubini. My name is Ross Fubini. I'm the founder and managing partner at XYZ Venture Capital, an early stage venture capital firm. And we do quite a bit in defense tech, which has been a very hot category these last couple days and months. I uh, emailed Ross to come on the show. Uh -huh. He emailed me back immediately and said, I got time right now or way later in the day. Which one do you want? I was like, uh, I can do it right now. He said, all right, wow. I'm hopping on the call right now. And then we get on the call. He's like, I have five minutes. Can you do it in five minutes? And wow. I was like, I can do it in five minutes. He's like, let's do it. How, how, how much time did it take? Four minutes, 48 seconds, wow. according to Riverside. He's just like that. He, he's like that. For my first question for Ross, the Army just consolidated 75 contracts into a single $10 billion deal with Palantir. What does that tell us about how the DOD is changing its approach to buying software, and what does it mean for other defense tech startups? Well, I think, firstly, it's showing that uh, Palantir is really just accomplishing its mission of trying to build better technology for warfighters and for the government and ultimately for all of us citizens. This has been the vision of the company literally since its founding days, and I was lucky to be there. And what we're seeing is really that the government has had so much success there that they are turning to Palantir versus the Deloitte's and the consultants of the world building custom software to get real solutions uh, put out there and fielded for folks. So I think this is uh, really a sign of Palantir's competency and quality. And what I think it means for new players is that if you're really solving problems, you're doing it in a high quality way, there's going to be money and resources to come together for you and that you can win in this market. For my next question for Ross, this contract suggests software is now seen as core to operational readiness, not just a back office function. How big of a cultural shift is that inside the U.S. military in defense procurement? So this is amazing and people just don't realize it. The, the, the rubric for years has basically been the government, particularly the DOD, is only good at buying hardware. And that's because as a, a Again, as a rubric, it was always like, we always build stuff. You know, you don't buy Salesforce, you build Salesforce. You don't buy your logistics management software. You go build one, which is incredibly expensive, expensive to maintain, but that's how our systems were designed. And here, I think we're seeing a growing awareness of the importance of software and then a growing awareness of the need and value of buying products. And these are just dramatic changes, and they mean that there's an opportunity for more software-only firms to go and build solutions for the government. And you cannot be understated how big of a deal this is. It's something we all think about in consumer life and our businesses. We, of course, we buy this way, and the government historically hasn't, and that's really shifting, too. We're, we're going to buy software packages, and we're going to value software packages. Wow. The biggest customer maybe in the United States is now dipping its toes into software. And so we're right. also saying it's, it's like this is just the beginning and we're going to see this giant wave of startups creating software for the government because now the government's down to say like, hey, we'll throw you guys hundreds of millions of dollars to create this software. Right. Whereas 
before, like he was saying, software was for the consumer, for you know the, the business. Now yeah, they'd make their own. Exactly right. Yeah. And so it's a pretty big moment for. Um, Could save us a lot of money as the the U.S. government, hundred percent. You know, which we need thirty six <laughs> trillion in debt. No, we can just Venmo. We can just Venmo the. That's right. To get the debt by the U.S. government. Um, for my next question for Ross, with this deal, Palantir is cementing its role as the default operating system for Battlefield data. Should other companies be worried, or is there still room to wedge in new players? This is just part. This is a, a an ecosystem, and they're a big, you know, they're a big planet. They're a big moon in this ecosystem. But uh, I ultimately think this is creating more opportunity for other companies. One, because it shows a pattern of other businesses you could go build. You can build an Oracle, so that means you can build, you know, a Microsoft and SAP, it's etc. Et so there's lots of things to go uh, build. And then secondly, I think it sets in some circumstances it stabilizes uh, data and infrastructure that. And you can build applications on top of. And we see many companies of ours, like Turbine One, that are building solutions on top of Palantir very, very successfully, sharing deals, sharing success, and scaling up that way. And I think we're just going to see more of that. I mean, this is quite the 180 for the U.S. Army, because yep. back in 2016, right, the, uh, the Palantir sued the U.S. Army for unfairly excluding it from bidding on a major battlefield intelligence system called, right. uh, it was called DCGSA, Distributed Common Ground System. System Army. So the uh, company argued that the Army had violated federal procurement law by not considering commercial off the shelf software like Palantir's that was already proven and in use by other agencies. Instead, the Army insisted on building a customer system from scratch, which Palantir okay. claimed would be more costly, less effective, and redundant. Federal judge sided with Palantir, ruling that the Army had improperly ignored existing commercial options, forcing it to reopen that bidding process back in 2016. Okay. The legal victory marked a turning point in Palantir's relationship with the Pentagon. So we've come a long way in the last nine years. Palantir's wanted the Army to be better. And so yeah. what better way to do that is going through the legal system to make them legally be better. <laughs> and so you, you, That's can, right. you can kind of thank Palantir for that. And so yeah. kind of leads to my next question with Ross. Palantir went from suing the Army in 2016 to becoming one of its largest software for suppliers, what changed in the Pentagon's mindset, and how did Palantir pull off one of the biggest comebacks in government contracting history? I don't think it was a comeback so much as this has just been a progression of of the government learning that they they need better solutions. And that's really come from the operators. It really truly has come from people with positive experiences with Palantir and other products out in the world. And that they have successes, they guess they, we want more of that. We don't want custom solutions. And of course, now in times of AI and changing public sector uh, landscapes, defense landscapes, there's just more and more need for that. There's more, more need for just solutions that work and it's solutions that work really cost effectively. Palantir, other companies in our portfolio, other companies out there are providing that. I think it's exciting for every citizen, every warfighter, everyone in the U.S. Thank you to Ross Fabini for being on the show today. All right, that's it for Venture Daily today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, hit us, hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you're not subscribed to us. And uh, let us know down in the comments what you liked about today's show or what we can improve. Yeah, and thank you to Content Stack for letting us back in the office. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> thank you to Content Stack for letting us film here every single day in Austin, Texas. Uh, whether on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, or X, throw us a like, comment, and a review. Throw us a five-star rating if you think we earned it. And as always, we'll see you here tomorrow morning at Venture Daily.